one. I was reading a story this past week about an Italian tenor by the name of uh, Luciano Averati. This is really hard to pronounce. Uh, Averati. And uh, anyway, uh, he passed away back in September the 6th, uh, 2007, but he was renowned as one of the greatest tenors that's ever been known. He also sang, and if you uh, follow any much of the Italian uh, singers and so forth, but he, was, uh, uh, he sang with the three tenors and sang a lot of um, uh, modern stuff as well as uh, operatic. He was primarily known as an operatic singer. But uh, uh, this young, this man was so committed to what he had to do. He, he the story tells us how he started out, and uh, as a young boy, uh, Luciano Pavarotti was a boy who uh, was the son of a baker. And his uh, father introduced him to singing quite early in his life and eventually was able to get him hooked up with a, a, one of the great voice teachers and singers by the name of Rigo Pola, um, a professional tenor in the hometown of Modena, uh, Italy. Anyway, uh, uh, at the same time that uh, uh, Usiano uh, took and began to uh, study music and, and, and uh, singing and so forth, uh, he was also introduced in the fact of going into college uh, to be a teacher. And so uh, one day he came home and he, he asked his father, he says, Father, I, I really have a difficult time here. I don't know whether I should be a teacher or if I should be a singer. And his father looked at him and said, if you try to sit on two chairs, Luciano, you're going to fall between them. You've got to make a commitment of what you're going to do. And Luciano, at that particular point of his life, committed himself to seven more years of study and preparing himself to sing. And then he spent additional seven years before he got into the opera. But he committed himself because he saw if you're going to do anything right, you must commit yourself. A lot of people don't like to commit themselves. They, they just touch the rim, but they never get committed. And I find this over and over and over again. The matter of two commitments is a swaying thing, especially in our society in our day and time. But as I look into the book of Revelation, chapter 1, I find one who was committed. And that one who was committed is none other than Jesus Christ. And a lot of times when you go to Revelation, you, uh, uh, you think about uh, things that are going to happen in the future. But Revelation not only gives us the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, it gives us everything in between. And when you begin to study Revelation, if you leave, by the way, when you study Revelation, a lot of people try to look at all these signs and they get upset and they kind of get uh, uh, shied away from the book of Revelation. But I want you to look down at a verse before I make the next statement. If you look down there in uh, verse number three, I want you to read that verse out loud with me. Would you please? If you're in Revelation chapter one, look at verse three. And I want you to read it out loud with me right now. Here we go. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Don't shy away from the book of Revelation. If you think of the book of Revelation as a book written about Christ, then you understand how important it is for you to read that book. Blessed is he that readeth. The whole book has to do with Jesus Christ and his commitment. And so that's what I want to share with you this morning. So I want you to look back at verse number 1. And I'm going to read down through verse number 8. We'll include once again verse 3 in that reading. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, now, don't underestimate the fact that Jesus is also God. 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus wasn't just a good man. Jesus wasn't just a prophet. He was the God man. You see, sometimes we take away from the fact of the deity of Jesus Christ because he came down to this earth and took upon himself a physical body, so we downgrade him. He's not to be downgraded, he's to be exalted. Matter of fact, you keep your place in Revelation chapter 1. I wasn't going to give you this, but I want you to turn back to the book of Colossians chapter 1. You see, I've come to exalt a person this morning and his name is Jesus because he committed himself to you and me to do all things for us. Look back here at Colossians chapter 1. Let me get there with you. In Colossians chapter 1, I want to begin down at verse number 13. And I want to read down through verse number 19 if you'll follow along with me. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son? In whom, speaking of Christ, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image, did you get that? He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him, speaking of Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Now get a hold of this. And he is before all things. That means he preexisted before he came and uh, took upon him the physical body of a person. And by him all things consist. In other words, everything stays in operative order until he changes otherwise. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. By the way, there's nobody else the head. Jesus Christ is the head. Not a preacher, not a pope. Jesus Christ is the head. Now watch this. He's the head by the church, who's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the what? Preeminence. I want to tell you something, folks. You make much of Jesus, and he'll make much of you. Look at the last verse there. For it pleased the Father that in him, that's Jesus, should all fullness dwell. In other words, he's the very representation of the Godhead, watch this, bodily, outwardly manifesting to show the Father. Why? Because he committed him to do so. He committed himself to take upon him and be the representative of the Godhead, Father and the Holy Spirit. And of course, he as the Son. So this morning, how is Jesus committed to you and me? I want us to have a word of prayer before I begin. And I want to ask you and encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart this morning. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Father in heaven, we want to make much of Jesus today. Because he committed to make much of us. He loves us. He cares for us. He understands everything that we need in our life. And so I praise you, Lord, this morning that you committed yourself that we might know the fullness of true life. I pray you would touch that heart this morning that needs to be saved. I pray you touch that Christian that maybe has grown a little bit cold and indifferent. I pray that you would touch that person who needs an uplifted spirit this morning uh, because they're discouraged or down. They need an uplift from you. So I pray you would touch them for your honor and your glory. May thy will be done in this hour now. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Look back at Revelation, would you please? And look there back at verse number one again. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, 
Grace be to you, unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which was which is to come and the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is a faithful witness. I want you to stop right there and if you don't have an underline in your Bible, underline it. One to be faithful is one who is committed to the fullest extent. And the Bible says on and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen behold he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him even so amen read verse 8 with me out loud everyone together I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end saith the Lord which is and which was and which is to come the Almighty now there's some things in those eight verses that Jesus has committed himself to do for you and me. I want you to see him this morning if you would please. If you look back at verse number one, first of all his commitment was made to his father in heaven. Now think about it if you would. God looked around heaven and thought maybe he would uh, send uh, maybe Gabriel or Michael down to the earth. And he said no. There must be someone who's eternal that I can send that has a power. And his son lifts his hands and says, I'll go. And he committed himself to the will of the Father to be obedient and to do what God, his Father, wanted him to be. Look back at verse number one. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him. God gave him a commission. And he came into this world to fulfill that commission, he would not give up. Though the devil hit him with all the forces that he possibly could hit with him with. He still did not bend. You think about that night as he was in the garden of the Gethsemane. And the blood squirted out of his veins and his arteries and so forth. And he had great uh, a greatness of uh, a spirit that came down upon him. That he felt like he possibly could even die, but he wouldn't do it. There were the other times... Think about this. Jumping back to the book of Matthew chapter 4. When he went to the wilderness there and he was tempted 40 days and 40 nights. The devil did everything he possibly could to rip him of his very being. And tried to get him to go against the will of the Father. And he said to the devil, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Three different times the devil tried to tempt him with all the scope of every temptation that could ever be placed under those three particular categories. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But he wouldn't bow to the devil. Why? Because he committed himself to the Father to do his will and not the will of what the devil wanted, see. He committed himself. Take your Bible, if you would, please, and keep your place in the book of Revelation. And turn over to the book of John, chapter 6, with me, would you please? Turn back there, if you would, to the book of John, chapter 6. And look down, if you would, at verse number 38. Look at verse 38 and read it out loud when you get there with me, please. Verse 38 of John chapter 6. Everyone together. Here we go. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. You see, Jesus committed himself to come down from heaven to do the will of God and not the will of his own, not the will of someone else, but his will the Father. In 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 23 it says, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered he threatened not, but committed himself, now listen to this, committed himself to him that judges righteously. You see in that commitment are wrapped up all the commitments for you and me that could ever be given to the Son. And he committed himself to do the will of the Father. He wasn't going to be veered to the left or to the right. You think about that day as he walked upon Golgotha's hill with that cross upon his back. 
after he had been lashed with all that could be lashed against him with that cat of nine tails that literally ripped the back of the, uh, the, the skin off his back and the blood began to come out. He still went on. And he fell beneath the cross, Scripture tells us. You see, he could have given up. But he went on. Remember, he had a physical body. Can't you, can't you think this morning how much excruciating pain the Lord Jesus went through as that nine, uh, cat of nine tails ripped his back open? And then he fell below, beneath that heavy cross that he was carrying? And then as he comes and gets to the top of Golgotha's hill, they lay that cross down. And they take that hammer and that, and that, and that uh, nails and they literally drive it through a very painful part of your body. If you were to take the part of your hand this morning and you would press in in that area right there, that could be very painful. Uh, several years ago, I was playing basketball. And I slipped and fell. And I went back on this hand right here. And to this day, I, this wrist, it just it pains me terribly. Sometimes I get arthritis in there so bad, I can't even lift something. Can you imagine the driving of those nails that went through his wrist there to hold it up? It didn't go through the palm of his hand. It would just rip it out. It was right in here where they put it. And how painful that must have been. But he committed himself to do the will of the Father. What was the will of the Father? For you and me. So what did he do for us? What did he commit? Not only did he commit himself to the Father, but if you take and you look there in verse number 5, if you jump down in Revelation chapter 1, look at the second commitment he made. Not only to the will of the Father, but he committed his love to you and me. Look at verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and, uh, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto whom that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. There's two things that he committed himself there in that single verse. He committed himself to love you and me. Even then, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You think about that, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Go back in your thinking to that verse. In Romans 5, 8, it says, But God commendeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In the grand spangled banner verse of all Scripture, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But he didn't stop there. He didn't say he just loved us. But look at the last part of that verse 5 there, if you would. A second commitment in that verse. And washed us from our sins in his own blood. Aren't you glad for the blood today? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You tell these heretics, these ungodly false teachers who teach that they can get to heaven, they can have their sins forgiven through uh, going, being baptized or doing good things, they're, they're walking up a tree backwards. As one guy says, they're flying, uh, the, 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 their thinking is worse than flying backwards in a hailstorm. Is it, Folks, God says he gave his son and shed his blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no payment for sin. Somebody says, uh, what's that no mean? Nothing. God says he washes, he committed himself to die upon that cross and shed his blood for the payment of sin. There's a promise there. He says, look, if you want to be saved, nobody's gone too far that he can't wash you in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Nobody's gone too far. You can be saved because Jesus shed his blood for every person. And he's died there upon the cross for you and me. Now look back at that verse 5, or if you would, if you please. He says, Unto him that loved us. That is in the present tense. Somebody says, well, he just loved us back on the cross. No, Jesus, the Bible says, he loved us 
with an everlasting love. Would you say that with me? He loved us with an everlasting love. His love goes on. You say, uh, does he still love every sinner the same? He loves every sinner the same, even though some have gone to hell. You say, well, if he loved them so much, he, he, he wouldn't let them stay there in hell. They have a choice of their own. He didn't make anybody get saved. He gives the invitation. He says, come, whosoever will may take the water of life freely. A person dies and goes to hell because they reject the love of God. They put aside the love of God. They think they can be saved on their own when he says, with that they shed in the blood, there is no payment for sin. You see, God's love today is equal to what it was on the cross. It's the same. I was thinking about that. Honey, when Danny was a little boy, I don't know if you remember it. Uh, he, he's not a little boy now. He's a big boy. Anyway, uh, I was thinking about this the other day. When Danny was a little boy there, he said, I would say to him, do you love your daddy? How many of you ever done that to your kids? Do you love me? Yeah, come on, raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, okay. You might have said it to your daughters, whoever it might be. Uh, do you love your daddy? And uh, he would shake his head, yes, or he would say yes. And uh, I'd say, how much do you love your dad? And he'd stretch out his arm and say, I love you this much. we look at God and say, how much did you love me? And he'd say, look on that hill called Golgotha. How wide my son spread his arms to show his love for you. And he still loves you. The same amount. For God so loved the world. You think about that this morning. But he committed himself not only to take and do the will of the Father, he not only committed himself to do what God wanted him to do, but he says, I've committed myself to keep on loving you. And I've committed myself that whosoever will may come and they can be saved because of the shed blood here he gave in verse number 5. Would you take there and look at verse number 5, the second part? He says, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He committed himself to keep us. You see, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from what? All sin. That means he's going to keep us. The blood of Jesus Christ never loses its power, does it? It's a keeping power. Uh, take your Bible, if you would, and uh, turn with me over to the, um, the book of 1 Peter, if you would. 1 Peter chapter number 1. Uh, th these are some great verses, and I want you to see them face to face this morning. I could quote them to you, but if you look at 1 Peter chapter 1, look down at verses 3 through 5. It says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope, the resurrection of, the de of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, read it with me now, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Folks, if you've got something reserved, it's ready for you to go on and occupy, okay? Now, here's the verse, verse 5. Who are kept, that word kept there literally means uh, to be guarded, to have a garrison around about you. Who are kept by the what? Power of God. Through faith and the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, Jesus committed himself to keep you. I, I listen, I don't have this uh, saved one day and lost the next. Man alive, what kind of salvation would that be? No, salvation is eternal. John, I like what he says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may what? Know that you have eternal life that you may believe on the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
You see, Jesus committed himself to keep you and me. Now wait a minute. Look back at Revelation chapter 1 and look at verse 6. There's a third thing here verse, uh, in verse number 6. There's a fourth thing. He is committed to make us. He is committed to make us. Look at verse 6. And hath made us kings and priests. Uh, he didn't say, I'm going to do it. He says, he's made us kings and priests. Folks, God gave you an exalted position. Amen. And we're to be praising the Lord what we have in Christ Jesus. We have been made priests and kings unto God and his Father, to whom be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You see, we've got a privileged place in God's standard. Um, I like what the Lord does. He not only made us kings and priests, but he made us something else. He made us fishers of men. He says, if you follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. I will make you fishers. Say that with me. I will make you fishers of men. Uh, we don't have to try to make ourselves. God said, I'll make you fishers of men. Some people say, preacher, I just can't win people to Christ. I can't witness people to Christ. Uh, well, why don't you let God make you? Huh? Let him train you. Let his Holy Spirit work through you to make you a soul winner and help people to come to know Christ as Savior. Yes, and if you're willing to do it, God will use you. I, I, and I hope Brother Fred don't get on me this morning. Uh, Brother Fred and I went up the other day to Best Buy to buy a, a, a computer for the church. And uh, I knew Brother Fred did this, and I know, I know that uh, Velma does too. I, 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 he wanted to give a track to everybody. I mean, he's excited about giving tracts to people and witness to people about Christ. You know, if everybody got excited like that, we'd win a whole world to the Lord. Amen. By the way, that's God's desire. Isn't that what he said? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't say put a pulpit, pulpit up on the, uh, on the sidewalk or on the corner. He said, preach the gospel. You preach the gospel, giving the track, giving your testimony, whatever it might be. Getting the gospel out to people. And we need to commit ourselves to that. But he committed us, he committed to make us. And here he gave us an exalted position of becoming kings and priests. Uh, don't look down. Listen. Don't look down on yourself. Look up to him. Huh? God wants you to know that you're somebody. Hey, somebody said, uh, I, I know something goes, God didn't make any junk. Amen. And I believe that. If you just take what God has made you and use it for the glory of God, people's lives will be touched. People's lives will be changed. And God will use you for his glory. But wait a minute. Look back at verse number 6. He is committed to strengthen us. Uh, how could you be a king or a priest if God didn't make you? If God makes you, you're going to be strong. I, I like that. That's the reason I believe Paul, when he wrote the, there by the Holy Spirit in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, he says, uh, listen, you're going to face some battles in your life. You're going to have the devil's going to be against you. We fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So he says, I'll tell you what, let me give you a secret. He says, if you look at verse number 10 of that chapter, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Folks, that's how we get the things done. And he committed unto us to strengthen us. Uh, I know we quote the verse uh, quite often, but let's quote it again this morning. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. Would you quote it with me? Here we go. I can do all things through Christ Jesus which strengthens me. Next time you say, well I just can't do that. Say, no wait a minute. Put your hand over your mouth. Say, God with your help I can do all things. Let's say that this morning. God, with your help, I can do all things. Let's try it one more time. God, with your help, I can do all things. No matter who we are, God can help you and strengthen you. But wait a minute. Jesus not only committed himself to strengthen your life because he says you can do all things through him. If you look down there in verse number 7, the Lord gives us something else very quickly. He is committed to come for us. 
He's committed. You know, people say, well, you, know, you, you folks are always talking about Jesus coming again. Jesus coming again. Jesus coming again. Folks, I got somebody who already said, I've committed myself. I'm going to come again. Huh? In verse 7, look at it. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierce him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him, even so, amen. You see, Jesus promised to come. In Malachi 4, 2, it says this, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And since Jesus is the Son of God, he is also the Son of Righteousness. And let me tell you something about the sunrise. The sunrise never comes ahead of time, and it's never late. And if Jesus says, I'm coming again, folks, he's coming again. Amen. And one of these days, he's going to break through the eastern sky. And he's going to come for you and me. I want to ask you a question. When he comes, are you going to be ready? The Bible says, be ready. For an hour you thinketh not, the Son of Man cometh. You say, tomorrow morning, you get up with the sunrise. You thank God for it. And Jesus said, look, just like that sun's going to rise. Just like the, the day is going to come forth. He says, I'm going to come one of these days. Be ye ready. For an hour that you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Therefore, be looking for the Lord. You see, in chapter number 4 of Thessalonians, he told us to look. Be ready. Therefore, live the right type of life. Chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians, verses 20 through 21. Therefore, stand fast. Therefore, be of one mind. Therefore, be of help to others. Therefore, rejoice, for your redemption draweth nigh. Therefore, turn to the one to prepare your soul. If you go back to the Old Testament, there were some people who committed themselves. Joshua said, for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. That's a commitment. How could he do that? Because he committed himself to the Lord. I think back there, Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In the book of Philippians, he made a commitment. He said, I'm just going to keep on keeping on. I'm going to keep on doing what's right. I'm going to keep preaching the gospel. Even when Nero came down on him, and possibly Nero was the one to put him to death, he said, I'm just going to keep on. I'm just going to keep on keeping on. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yacht not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. You see, God wants us to make a commitment. Jesus said this in Luke 23, verse 46. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. You see, he made a commitment because he was going to do something. What was he going to do? He was going to send back to the Father. And he committed himself that he was going to be one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And he's made that commitment. He's in heaven. And he's making intercession for you and me, the Bible tells us, there in Hebrews chapter 1. He sits at the right hand of the throne of God, making intercession for you and I, day and night. Amen. You see, making a commitment. I like what it says there in Isaiah 1.18. Come now, and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be like crimson, they shall be as wool. The story was told of a man giving his testimony at a Salvation Army meeting concerning committing his life to Jesus Christ. He'd been saved. His life had been changed. And there was, heck, there was this heckler in the crowd. And uh, after uh, this man had given his life to Christ and he was giving his testimony, the heckler began to say, Would you shut up? You're just dreaming. And after he said that, there was a young girl that was near him and she came over and tugged on his pants. And uh, she said this to the heckler. She said, um, that's my daddy up there. That's my daddy. He used to be a drunkard and he'd beat my mommy. 
We didn't have enough food to eat. But when he got saved, my daddy's life has changed. See that woman over there? That's my mommy. See how happy she is? Because my daddy got saved and committed his life to Christ. Folks, that's what God does with commitment. And the greatest example that we ever had was Jesus Christ himself. Shown us here right in the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 1. He committed himself to us. Can we do anything less than to commit our own selves to him? Would you bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, this morning you've committed yourself to save whosoever will may come. You commit yourself to give us the strength that we need and the grace to bear up under the pressures of this life and to do and be obedient unto you if we would do it. And all you want us to do is to follow the example of your son Jesus who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And can we do anything less than what he's done for us and given our life to him turning our hearts unto Him and being saved, turning our lives over to Him to serve Him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And Lord, I ask You to take this service now. And I ask You to commit it unto Your glory and praise and for that person that needs to make a decision this morning. They will make a commitment unto You. May Your will be done in this invitation. And the end result, Lord, I pray that You will be glorified. And we'll thank you for it. Because I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?